In August of 2009, NASA's wicked actions claimed the lives of 57 innocent individuals, making it one of the most devastating crimes in Kuwaiti history. And in fact, NASA had become so publicly hated that none of the 57 victims' families requested anything less than the maximum penalty. But what crimes did NASA Youssef Alenzi commit, and what were her motives? Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening folks. My name is Adrian, and welcome back to another video by Coffeehouse Crime. Today we're looking at the case of Nasser Youssef Alenzi. The perpetrator of this case shook the small country of Kuwait right to its core, to the point where the nation had to change its laws. And just to let you know that I post solved, unsolved, and strange cases here weekly, so if that sounds like your kind of thing, please consider subscribing to Coffeehouse Crime. So please, grab yourself a coffee, take a seat, and sit back my friend. This is the case of Nasra Youssef Alanezi. Today, we're traveling to yet another new country on the Coffeehouse Crime map. Taking you far into the Middle East, welcome to the small country of Kuwait, folks. It is so small, in fact, that the whole country only has half the population of the city of London. It is nestled between the countries of Iraq and Saudi Arabia, and although Kuwait has had a turbulent history with its neighbours, this hasn't stopped it from economically rocketing in the past couple of centuries. The country boasts a high-income economy due to its access to the sixth largest oil reserve in the world, and for a country as small as Kuwait, that is a lot. So much so that the Kuwait dinar is currently the strongest currency in the world, making it the fifth richest country internationally. With the general landscape in Kuwait being a barren desert, it has some of the highest recorded temperatures in the world, and regular summers often hit over 50 degrees Celsius or 122 Fahrenheit. Found towards the edge of its sprawling capital city, aptly named Kuwait City, we find the main character behind our story today, and that's 23-year-old Nasra Youssef Alanezi. Living in Kuwait City, Nasra lived with her 36-year-old husband Zayed Safira and their two children. The pair married when Nasra was in her late teens, and it didn't take them long to welcome two children into their household. And although not much is known about Nasra while growing up, she evidently struggled with her mental health. But sadly, like much of the rest of the world, stigmatization is still prevalent around mental health, and these issues were never addressed, diagnosed, or treated. She was known to be erratic, impulsive, and generally unpredictable when it came to day-to-day -day behavior. Which, I'm sure, won't come as a surprise further down the line in this story. Despite her previous mental health issues, Nasra and Zayed lived a relatively happy life. As is typical in Kuwaiti families, Nasra stayed at home and looked after the children while upkeeping the household. And all in the meanwhile, Zayed went to work, financially providing for the family. Now, unfortunately, Nasra found her situation particularly stressful. Both of her sons had special needs, which required far more care than most children. Stressed and stretched thin, her husband was unimpressed. Zayed hadn't married her to be a stressed mother of two disabled children, and this prompted him to selfishly look elsewhere for a new partner. Now, in Kuwait, it's neither illegal nor religiously frowned upon to have multiple wives, as polygamy has been part of their society for thousands of years, and up to four wives is generally accepted. So Zayed started to search for a second wife, and understandably, this did not sit well with Nasra. She was still at home looking after their children, or while her husband was out seeking a new wife. This is often done by a matchmaker who will build profiles on matching partners to then put forward for consideration, and usually, not long after a match is found, the two are wed as soon as possible. Nasra hated the way her husband had left her. She believed that he resented her for their children being born handicapped, and that he was remarrying to try for more children. This was a generally slow process, and the resentment that Nasra felt had been simmering under the surface for quite a long while. The jealousy, frustration, and anger came to a boiling point in August of 2009, which was the month that Zayad formally announced he had chosen a second wife, and that they were due to marry later that very same month. Although she was internally furious, Nasra decided to keep her cool. She didn't act or lash out in any physical way that attracted attention. I mean, granted, she did want revenge on her husband. But if she was going to make him pay for his adulterous actions, she was willing to wait for the perfect moment. August the 15th, 2009. It was another usual day in Kuwait, and temperatures were soaring in more than one way. 
Today was the day of Zayed and his new wife's wedding. They had planned the ceremony to be in Al Jara, located just west of Kuwait City. Kuwaiti weddings are a very official affair. In recent years, they have transformed to resemble American-style ceremonies, rather than their formerly traditional Kuwaiti style. Some could probably guess, but a lot of money goes into them. These festivities are often wildly extravagant and expensive, costing anywhere from $100,000 all the way into the millions. We're talking flowers imported from Holland, food imported from Paris, and performers sourced worldwide. By midday, the ceremonies were all well underway, and all in the meanwhile, the tents had been set up to host guests. At a Kuwaiti wedding, it is customary for the men and women to celebrate separately. This allows the women to relax, as they can shed their head and face coverings in the absence of men. So while one tent was officially reserved for the men, the others were for the women and children. Grand and white to keep cool in the hot Kuwaiti heat, these tents are large enough to accompany not dozens, but hundreds of people. However, the ones they had hired for today were not up to regular safety standards. You see, this tent had only one exit, and otherwise was inescapable. An issue that would have grave consequences later in this story. Magical plans progressed without a hitch, and as the official portions of the ceremony came to a close, both the men and women were enjoying their festivities separately. But in the background, past the many guests who joyfully continued with the music, food, and conversation, lurked Nasra. Sadly, she hadn't changed her mind over the previous weeks, and claiming revenge against her husband was still very much on the table. And what better way to achieve that than by targeting his very own wedding? Kuwait's dry and arid weather can be a very dangerous partner with fire, and to aid her vicious plan came the use of petrol, which had been carefully placed nearby at an earlier time. With many women and children inside, Nasra began to soak the perimeter of the tent, and with the temperature soaring well above 50 degrees Celsius or 122 Fahrenheit, it didn't take long at all for the tent to catch a light. Everyone inside was entirely unaware of the danger unfolding all around them, and once they began to smell smoke emanating from the fire, panic began to break out immediately. People began to run for the only way in and out of the tent, but with this tent so large and maze-like, panic and chaos immediately began to set in. The size of the exit could not handle the sheer volume of people all trying to leave at the same time, thus causing a jam of people all clambering over one another, eager to escape. And sadly, alongside the disorderly panic, it was impossible for all guests to make it out alive. The fire engulfed the tent, and it steadily claimed the lives of those who remained inside. The hot Kuwaiti weather aided the fire within, the internal temperature of the tent rising to a staggering 500 degrees Celsius, or 930 Fahrenheit. Those who were unable to escape succumbed to either the flames or the temperature, and in only three minutes since the initial spark, the tent had completely burned to the ground, leaving behind a mass of charred clothing and furniture burned down to the metal frames. There was no time for emergency services to react, and in those three minutes, the fire had claimed the lives of 41 innocent women and children. Although many of the guests had managed to escape, a further 90 people had been injured, either through being burned or the panic. As emergency services began combing through the remains of the disaster, they found that many of the victims had been burned beyond recognition, and as a result, they had to seek a specialist team for identification. They used dental and medical records in order to identify the victims. And over the following days, several of those who were critically injured from the attack would also succumb to their burns. In the end, the total number of dead rose to 57, coupling this with an additional 74 injuries. This crime had become one of the worst tragedies in Kuwaiti history. The scale of this tragedy, which officials say is the worst such incident in four decades, has brought both grief and recrimination. The immediate focus, though, is on trying to save the lives of the many critically injured victims now in hospital. Both the new bride and the groom came out of this disaster unscathed, as at the time, neither of them was actually in the tent when the fire occurred. Authorities immediately began to work on investigating what had caused the fire. They initially suspected that faulty electrics were to blame, or perhaps the coals used for burning incense. However, as they dug deeper, it became evident that this was, in fact, no accident. The fire had been deliberately lit in an act of arson. This was actually a shock to both families. Both Zayed and his new wife were well-liked within the communities, and as far as they knew, neither of them had any enemies. 
As for Nasra, she had kept relatively quiet about her frustrations, so she was not an obvious suspect. But due to her close relationship with Zayed, she was automatically selected for questioning. It wasn't hard to find her either, as she was at home looking after her children. And soon after being taken into custody, came a harrowing confession. Before even considering a lawyer, Nasra broke down and confessed to setting the tent ablaze with petrol-soaked rags. But soon after being advised to lawyer up, Nasra's tone changed immediately. She no longer took accountability for the crime, and formally requested for a confession to be redacted, citing she had come under pressure in the moment. This motion was ultimately denied, and her initial confession soon became part of the overwhelming evidence during her trial. But legal proceedings for this case would take various twists and turns. While being held in prison, it was discovered that Nasra was, in fact, pregnant with Zayed's third child. This complicated things greatly. Capital punishment is legal in Kuwait, and is usually the standard sentence for murder. But pregnant women cannot be sentenced to death for obvious reasons, so instead, they would be served with a life sentence even after the child is born. Whether her pregnancy was faked, or if Nasra had indeed miscarried, we will never actually know. But two months later, when she was no longer found to be pregnant, she instead claimed that her husband had arranged for a prison guard to force her to take medication which caused her to miscarry. The claim was never followed up, and no medical examination was ever undertaken to prove the validity of Nasra's supposed pregnancy or miscarriage. This defense was brought up in Nasra's trial in March of 2010, but it didn't seem to hold up much credibility. It was ultimately dismissed, and considering her terrible atrocities, the judge didn't believe she deserved any leniency for her crimes. This seemed to be the general public's attitude too, as most of Kuwait saw her as a selfishly evil young woman. She had single-handedly murdered 57 women and children in a bit of jealousy. So in Kuwait, it's standard court practice to allow the victim's families to waive their right to retribution, therefore allowing the court to let Nasra escape the death penalty. And despite the court needing only one waiver to consider this option, not one single family of the victims did so. Nasra's defense team threw every possible excuse they could find, trying to leverage her age, gender, and even mental state in order to gain a shred of sympathy. But the evidence, the victim's families, and the court were all strongly against Nasra, and although her defense tried to reduce her sentence to life imprisonment, they were ultimately unsuccessful. Her previous confession was ultimately redacted, and according to Nasra, the real story was that she never actually intended to start the fire. Apparently, she thought that this highly flammable petrol was actually water, and she used this during the ceremony to curse her husband's new marriage. Obviously, this would not hold up in court. An eyewitness eventually came forward to confirm she had witnessed Nasra pouring the petrol around the tent, and then setting it alight. Not sure what kind of water needs a lighter, but Nasra's second confession clearly needed more work. Nasra was ultimately found guilty of her actions, and with no actual pregnancy confirmed, she was sentenced to death for murdering 57 women and children, and injuring a further 74 others. The court upheld the sentencing due to the severity of her crimes, and out of respect for the victims and their families. Nasra would be the second woman in Kuwaiti history to ever receive the death penalty. As said before, women usually get lighter sentences, but clearly not in this case. Following her trial, new measures were put in place to ban the use of wedding tents if they had not been erected by certified bodies, and all safety precautions must now rigorously be followed. This tragic event scarred the people of Kuwait. Kuwait is considered to be an extremely peaceful nation with relatively low crime rates. Many couldn't believe that a woman had caused so much pain and devastation in three mere minutes. And although she insisted that she didn't mean to kill anybody, it is clear as day to see that Nasra's actions were premeditated, with the intention to kill. These intentions would ultimately take the lives of 57 completely innocent people all there to celebrate what should be one of the happiest occasions, the wedding of a loved one. Like I said before, although Nasra intended to kill the bride, she was unsuccessful in her mission. But tragically, the bride's mother and sister were both killed in the process. Seven years later, on January the 25th, 2017, Nasra's sentence was finally carried out. She was one of seven people to be executed that day, three of whom were women. And strangely enough, the first to be executed on that day was a member of the reigning royal family, after it was learned that he had murdered his disabled nephew in a dispute. Usually, the media is allowed to be present at these events. 
However, during this day, they were forbidden to be present, likely due to one of the prisoners being of the royal family. Nasra was later executed by private hanging by the prison guards, supposedly giving the families of her victims some sense of justice for their loved ones. And alongside her death, so concludes the case, which ended 57 innocent lives. 57 lives lost, all over the emotions of one. Hi there folks, and thank you so much for watching another video today by Coffeehouse Crime. If you found this video interesting, or you learned something new today, then please remember to like the video and subscribe if you haven't yet. So this case was slightly smaller than my usual, as of recently I've been trying to do more international true crime cases. Please let me know what you think of this kind of format. I guess the main question here is, would you like to see more international true crime cases, or would you prefer more traditional true crime and internet-based cases? Honestly, I have so many interesting stories in my back pocket, so it's up to you what kind of ones you would like to see first. Just a reminder that I'm always open to case suggestions, so if you do have one, please feel free to leave a comment down below or drop me an email. And thank you to all of you who have done so already. And also, I really appreciate your patience in bearing with me as I move house and change studio. This was actually a lot more disruptive than I'd have imagined. I do hope to be back to two videos a week from this week onwards. Anyway, I just wanted to say that I really appreciate you, and I really appreciate your time. And I'll be back again soon for another video. But until that moment arrives, please remember to look after each other and stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye. And by the way, I post Solved, Unsolved, and Strange Cases here weekly. So if that's... <laughs> say the same thing over and over again, and it doesn't sound right. Like, you know when you say banana? Banana, 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 banana. What a strange person! Banana doesn't sound like a word anymore. Try it. Banana.